Madison Library of Information Science and a JD from Berkeley School of Law. She has taught as an adjunct professor at Simmons College and at the UC Berkeley School of Law. She has consulted with libraries and nonprofits on copyright, privacy, and other technology law concerns. Her research interests include copyright, tensions within teaching and scholarly communication, and more broadly, human rights concerns within information law and policy, including privacy, access to knowledge, and intellectual freedom. Hi, and now my back is turned to you guys. Um, hang on one second, let me just open up my slide. There we go. Um, I have to say, it's a little daunting coming after Peter, who, there he is, he's back in the room, because um, um, he, he's so modest, but he, he, what he doesn't tell you is that he's, you know, one of our preeminent um, scholars or, or knowledgeable people, experts on public domain work in particular, and just really copyright in general. And so, um, you know, he's the kind of person of whom you like to say, oh, he's forgotten more than I ever knew. And I was thinking about that, and then I thought, I don't think he's forgotten it, right? So, like, you can't really say that because... Um, it just doesn't feel right. So let me go into presenter view. And then Peter, how did you have it with the computer? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, how can I, let's see. That doesn't really look like presenter view. Wait, there we go. Big screen. All right. So um, Peter did such a nice job of kind of breaking down a lot of the issues with contracts that, that I'm not, I'm going to be able to go pretty quickly through some of that stuff, right? Like, the basics of, you know, that you own things. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the nitty gritty of things because um, I am a copyright attorney and I guess this is an opportunity moment to say this is not legal advice, right? Um, but, um, um, but what I like to do is educate people about their contracts and I actually feel really passionate about it because, you know, when you guys publish or when I publish or when any of us publish, we are mostly unrepresented parties and the publisher is very represented, right? They have a legal staff, not just like a single lawyer, drafting multiple agreements, you know, trained in, in copyright law or, or in contracts. And so, you know, there's really a tremendous disparity in, in sort of access to resources and understanding. So um, I just feel, you know, these contracts end up being so one-sided. And so I really feel it's so important to educate people about their contracts. And um, this is kind of what we'll talk about. I'm not going to talk much about this, why you should negotiate, because Peter covered that so much. And um, the how to negotiate, we'll talk about briefly. But we'll spend a lot more on the confusions. And actually, I'm going to pass out some contracts to you guys. You've all seen contracts, I suspect. But we'll just take a few minutes and kind of look at you know, some different ones and then talk through the different clauses and like how you could redo them. Um, so, you know, why you should negotiate, I think Peter again covered all of this kind of thing. Um, he talked a lot about the publishing contract issues, and one of the other things that I would also mention and bring up is the standard contract stuff. And again, this is why this is education, not legal advice, because it's generally applicable to everything. You'll find this in, you know, all sorts of clauses. You're being asked to sign an indemnification clause, and you may not even know what an indemnification clause is but you will. Um, so, you know, I, I like to use the phrase a legal stranger to your own work because that comes, um, that phrase, you know, you're a legal stranger to each other came up quite a lot during the fight for equal marriage. And, um, you know, the, those two people who are so intimately connected were legal strangers to one another. And this is often how I actually think of authors and their publishing published works when they assign the copyrights to a publisher, right? You're laughing that you have become a legal stranger to your work. You have no more rights over it than if you were a stranger, in many cases, if you've assigned your copyright away wholesale. So um, a legal stranger to your own work and the kinds of things that you might want to do with it that you can't. And again, Peter has, has covered many of those things. And, and frankly, you know, Peter said he's, he's heard from like one or two students or maybe, maybe more who have been asked to um, pay permission fees for a figure. I've, I've talked to quite a lot of them, right? And it's especially terrible for the humanists, right, who are on tiny grants, probably going to get even tinier in the near future, right? Tiny grants. And then they're asked to shout $500 for a figure, a figure they created themselves in their, you know, undergraduate, their graduate research, and now they're a new junior faculty member. It's just so upsetting to them. And they, they're just looking at me and saying, do I really have to do this? You know, and I'm just like, well, let's look at your contract and let's look at what, you know, the new contract for your new paper is saying. And, and those are the things that are going to govern. Fair use can apply in some instances, but if your publisher doesn't, if your current publisher isn't accepting fair use and you can't, 
get them to do that, then you know you really have to look at those kinds of things. So I, my, my goal here is to really help you figure out different ways and strategies to negotiate your contracts or, or, or tricks, actually, to retain your rights, even when you maybe feel awkward or, or you don't have an OA policy. Um, but, um, but at the core, you know, you just have to think of like the sad humanist who has no grant, who's being asked to shell out money. And as Peter said, you know, this is not pro forma, right? The publishers, we used to think of this as, you know, to use a sexist term as a gentleman's world, a gentleman's agreement, right? Like, oh, we'll give away our copyright because it's so meaningless, you know? And in fact, in the Copyright Act negotiations, they called it like the gentleman's agreement, right? It was, it was, we'll give away our copyright because it's really meaningless formality that the publishers need to do this. And um, some time in the last 30 years or so when we academics were collectively paying attention to other pressing needs in the academy, the publishers have become a big business. And this is a big business. And not just for the for-profit publishers, but even for our friends, the scholarly publishers, right? They will then um, contract their journals to the for-profit publishers, make a ton of money, fund their conferences, fund their scholars um, to go to those conferences. So they're doing good things with those um, revenues, but it's significant revenues, even on um, fields where you might not imagine there could be significant revenues. Feminist, interdisciplinary studies of, you know, multiculturalism, right? Maybe bringing in millions of dollars from their journal. Um, but it's all coming out of our pockets and with a hefty dose of profit for the middleman. So if we can somehow reform scholarly publishing, right, so that we kind of keep these monies and still do all the good things, that would be the ideal. In the meantime, I just want to help the individual authors, too. Um, so a few common misconceptions, right? Publishers, and especially editors, don't be mad at your editors when they hand you these terrible contracts. The editors probably know less than you, okay, about what they're doing or what they're asking. They don't understand the difference between the assignment and the transfer or what a license is. They probably understand very little of this. They're, you know, recently academics or quasi-academics themselves, and, you know, they just let the lawyers handle it. And they take on good faith assurances that they're, doing something to bring scholarship to the world, right? So they are your friend in that sense, but they are working on some level also as an agent for a highly legally represented company, okay? So the publisher does not need copyright, and editors will say, oh, yeah, we just need that to sign it, right? That's the old pro forma gentleman's agreement world that they think they're still speaking for. And it's not the case, as Peter said, Really, all a publisher needs to publish is your permission to publish. They don't need the assignment of the copyright. Um, a license gives them what they need. But what they want, they do want those rights because they can make money off of it. They can control it. And in some instances, it's not just about making money. It's about controlling it or doing other things. And it's a mix. Some of what they want to do is in your interest, and some of it is not. All right? Um, so, and, and I love this phrase, you know, we often think of like, oh, it's exclusive rights, right? And we think that means it's special or fancy or, you know, that, um, that, that, you know, only the publisher gets it. Actually, what it means is the publisher has the right to exclude everybody else, including you, um, the author. And so it's that funny twist on the use of the term exclusive um, that is in copyright world. Um, can I negotiate? People are like, I, you know, I have literally talked to people who just don't even know that they can negotiate these agreements. They think they just have to sign them. Yes, you can negotiate them, and you should. It's like buying a house or a car or hiring a contractor. And they've already given, you've already given them something, the right to make a profit off of your work, right? And so you have nothing to lose, and they have everything to lose, because by the time the article has been accepted, right, has already gone through peer review, they have sunk in all of their credibility, they have sunk in, in their researchers' time that they're using for peer review, they have put in a lot of resources into the book or the article or the book chapter, and so they are not interested in rejecting you. That's not to say that they won't negotiate hard, you may not get what you want, right? Oftentimes you have to go back several times in a negotiation to get what you want. Um, and your nerves of steel may wilt <laughs> midway through the process and you may not get everything. That's okay, it's practice. The next time you'll feel maybe a little bit more emboldened. But um, as Peter said, you know, they don't reject authors simply for trying to negotiate. Right? 
Um, I, I do tell people they can take it to another publisher, but oftentimes by the time the author is invested in the publisher, and especially if you're junior faculty and you're on the tenure clock, you don't have time to take it to another publisher. So um, it's important to, I think, when you're talking to somebody who's publishing or when it's you yourself, you know, thinking about what your ultimate goals and what you need are. But you know, just do always remember there might be other publishers out there. Maybe you were thinking about two different possible publishers or you have an angle with someone else. And you might be in a position to actually say, you know what, I'm sorry, Yale is going to be a better fit for me at this point. Um, the license or transfer, Peter, again, showed this. Right? I love this when they were like, well, no, 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 you're keeping the copyright. We're just accepting all of the rights. No. In, in fact, in copyright law, it is defined um, that um, the transfer of rights, the exclusive transfer of rights, is the transfer of copyright. And again, this is just an example of people not understanding the exact language. So your editor is not trying to mislead you, I believe, most of the time. They just simply don't understand. Um, so how do you actually do this? You write in things and you strike out things. It's literally that simple. And um, you could add addenda, which sort of basically create like page two of the contract, right? It's like additional pieces of the contract. Um, you might have to go back several times. A campus open access policy can eliminate the need for individual negotiation of a lot of things. Depending on how your campus has interpreted their policy or how they phrased it, it might completely eliminate the need or they might still want you to notify the publisher or to like put a little asterisk and say they're subject to the OA policy. So, you know, there are lots of locally specific conditions that can apply, but a campus OA policy is definitely your friend. Um, so, um, or institutional policy. So this is a contract actually that um, I had a very savvy person come to me and she had actually already begun the negotiations process. And so she had some things and then she um, ended up doing some more. So, you know, it ends up looking something like this, right? Um, and here is an example of an addendum. All right, so let's actually start talking about the contract. Do you guys want to jump in? I'm kind of like off on a run, but you can all jump in and talk to me at any point. I yes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard, uh, sorry, I'm new to this, that publishers can decide if they will accept fair use. Yeah. Now, that's a scary thing to me, and mm. I would... So, so whenever, uh, if a faculty wants to know if they can use a particular article with fair use for their teaching, which they didn't... Oh, um, yes. I'm back. Yes. I, I think I know where you're going. Okay. Um, they can't just look at the law. Yeah, no, no, no. When a faculty member is using a published work or, a, or another work, the faculty member or anybody else can just rely on fair use. What I mean is, if you're publishing an article and you include some figures and some quotes and some screen caps from another thing, and you're like, well, these are all clearly fair use, right? Because I'm super familiar with fair use, because my UConn librarians have taught me about it and I understand it, and I can clearly say that these are fair use, right? And your publisher of the new article is just like, yes, yeah, sorry, you have to get permission for everything. That's what I mean when I say the publisher may or may not accept fair use. That is actually a point you should negotiate on. You should say, well, you should accept fair use. But when you're publishing, the publisher, it's, it's, they have nothing to lose by just ignoring it and just passing it off to you because it provides them even a fraction more risk coverage, even a tiny little bit, and it puts a lot of work on you, unnecessary work. Um, but it doesn't hurt them at all because it's just a line in the contract that says so, shift the burden. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a, a negotiated... You can totally negotiate that. I love when people negotiate that. Yeah. So in my instance more, I'm thinking about um, model contracts. Mm -hmm. So the way I photograph, it's in public space. So I don't need a model contract. But potentially... Again, for similar reasons, a publisher might want me to have one. To Are you talking about there. contracts with the subjects of your photography? Yeah. Well, yeah. no. They're not the subjects, but they're in the images. Uh-huh. So right, the people who are in the images. Place, mm -hmm. you basically have no right to privacy, right? That's right. 
But in some publishing situations, if there are people in your photographs, if they're identifiable, they might want releases. Right, yeah. Yeah. So um, that wouldn't be a fair use so much because the the individual people who are it's in the images, kind of it's a similar concept. You're absolutely yeah, right. Okay. So it's not a copyright where you get to say, I'm hey, publisher, you should accept fair use. That's exactly right. But right. you can say, hey, publisher, please acknowledge, you know, the norms of the photography world that they're, you know, and, and privacy norms that, you know. Well, it's a conversation you had before I signed the contract because, you know, I'm here because I am on the verge of a book. And oh, good. Issues, Excellent. So. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, yeah. So one of the things I do at UMass is I actually walk people through this kind of on an individual basis, which makes it tricky to sort of talk. You can, you can, you can, because it, we're a public institution, and even though you're not part of the Commonwealth, we love our neighbors in Connecticut, too. Um, um, no, I mean, it's, it's tricky in terms of thinking about legal advice, because I talk to you about your specific contract, but I do try to do it in an educational way and say, like, this is this, the array of terms. So what are the array of terms, right? In any publishing contract, you're going to have all this typical legal stuff, which is indemnifications and warranties, and um, the choice of law and the merger clauses and all that stuff. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you those. And we're going to pass out some examples. And then you've got the publishing clause details that you guys probably think about, right? And especially if you've done a book or a book chapter, you're like, what are my royalties? Do I get to control the title or the cover image, right? Those are the things you know to negotiate and that people care a lot about. How many free copies do I get? Great. It's nice to negotiate those things. And especially, you know, if you're in the textbooks, you could make a ton of money. So you care a lot about royalties. If you're, you know, an art person, you might care a lot or just maybe a very meticulous person, you might care a lot about the font selection or the design layout, right? So negotiate the things that are important to you. But the third section is the substantive publishing clauses. Those are the transfer of rights. And that's the piece that I think gets very much too neglected, very much neglect, too often neglected, right? And that's the piece that I want to talk about maybe the most. Um, so um, all right, that basic stuff, representations and warranties. Um, these are warrant, you'll see them listed as both, um, representations or warranties or guarantees maybe. Um, these are the promises that you're making regarding your work typically, right? And you might see embedded in the same clause or maybe in a separate clause because this is the thing to remember. Every contract can look very different. They're just individual agreements, right? And they can be drafted, and some of them can be simple and straightforward, and some of them can be intimidating and complex, right? But they all still have these same kinds of clauses. So um, representations and warranties will often be tied to indemnification. Do you guys know what indemnification is? There's usually some people who do. Yes, and do you want to add to that? I, I know state agencies can't uh, agree to indemnify. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because their sovereign immunity. Yeah, so an indemnification basically says you agree to pay the legal expenses for the other party, you know, in such and such condition, you know, such and such conditions. And you're exactly right. The University of Connecticut, the University of Massachusetts, um, state agencies typically will not or are even forbidden by law from signing those clauses because it's taxpayer money. But it's also just a good contracting principle. Like, why on earth would you, faculty member X or librarian Y, sign to pay the legal <laughs> expenses for? you know, giant publisher, right? I mean, it's nuts when you think about it, and yet you are really and truly on the hook when you sign these indemnification clauses for doing that. And so um, I like to get people to really scrutinize those kind of carefully. And, you know, it's hard to get rid of them completely, but you can reconstruct them a little bit to make them reasonable. You may or may not be able to um, negotiate this successfully, right? But... Um, if you can, it doesn't hurt to try, right? And, and you might be able to get it successfully. Um, you will often see, particularly in scientific publications, clauses around conflicts of interest, funding, data management. I think those things are pretty good. You want to read them carefully. Um, the rights granted, this is the stuff that I think is very important you, that to edit. Um, delivery of work, your dates, right? The royalties, the prize money, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the legal magic, right? It might be hard to get it, and in some ways it won't affect your everyday life 
under most contracts. But if something goes very wrong, right, that's when those things come into play. So those are goods to negotiate them. So that's the part that you have to say, because it's not the kind of, you know, the Polish race in Chicago, they want to use Chicago law for mm -hmm. arbitration or whatever, but yep. me, I am Connecticut, I could not want my Connecticut state yeah. law to apply, so this is what you need to negotiate. Yeah, and you're probably not going to, you're probably not going to get that choice of law clause. Yep. Yep. So that's choice of law. It might be worth it negotiating that kind of thing, or at least paying attention to it. For instance, you know, you can't know everything, but it, you might know if you are in the sort of field where you're doing maybe contemporary historical research. And so sometimes there are living figures who can get annoyed, right? And that defamation is an issue in your field, right? In that case, you may want to know that the United Kingdom is kind of a you know, a prime shopping destination for defamation plaintiffs, right? And so if your choice of law is the United Kingdom, you might be like, ooh, I need to think about that, and I want to pay a lot of attention to my indemnification clause, right? Because my risk has gone up a little bit, you know? Um, if your choice of law is one state or another in the United States, you know, there's probably not going to be a tremendous amount of difference with respect to defamation, but maybe some other right might be affected. And so... You know, we pay attention to those kinds of things. Um, arbitration is actually a big one that I would flag for people. Arbitration clauses are almost always consumer unfriendly in any contract, not just publication. And if you can change it from arbitration to just cross it out entirely or change it to mediation, that's a big win for you. Um, the merger clause, you will rarely see the phrase merger clause, but what you will often see um, is language that says, you know, nothing else in this besides this agreement is valid, right? And basically that means that all the emails you had with your editor or the phone conversations you had with your editor where they're like, don't worry, right? Those don't matter. What's within the four sides of your contract, that's what matters. Did you want to say something, Jim Ben? Yeah, so... Um, <sighs> Again, your editor is trying to do the best they can, but I think Peter mentioned an example um, of translations, and I had just really this very heartbreaking story where, you know, this guy whose English was not his first language, and um, he did a book with um, a very well-known academic press, and the academic press it was actually Elsevier. I'll out them. Um, the academic press was like, yeah, don't worry your pretty little head, they said to him, about, about the translation rights. We'll work that out, right? And then he gets it, and then he's a few months later, he's like, all right, I'm ready to go ahead because I really want to get my book translated back in China because, you know, I've got a publisher lined up. That's my country. I want to get it in this region. You know, I, he had a lot of very particular kind of heart-rending reasons for wanting to do this. And they were just like... I don't know, it says here in the contract that we have the translation rights, we'll, we'll get back to you. And so it went back and forth multiple times, and he, and he wrote this really heart-rending letter. He's like, this was like my child. He, and um, he's like, I worked so hard on this. And um, so, you know, unfortunately, they just were not willing to budge, and they did have the translation rights, and they're sitting on them, okay? And so, um, yeah, so, you know, all right. Uh, the publishing clause is the term and territory. You'll see, you know, where does it apply, right? If you're a publishing a book, you know, do they have the rights? Are they limiting their rights to a particular geographic scope? They're probably taking them in all rights and all media and all territories in perpetuity, right? But you may have a connection to Colombia, right? I had another person who wanted specifically to make, she didn't care about the whole rest of the world. She really wanted Colombia, right? And she's like, she's like, except Colombia. She put in a carrot, except Colombia, right? She wanted to handle the Colombia stuff. You can do that kind of thing. Um, royalties. Um, here's a two quick things on royalties. One, if you are doing a book, you might expect to get royalty checks um, periodically. Oftentimes, you don't get them until they've accumulated to a certain amount. And if you're in the academic world, it might be a very long time <laughs> before it accumulates, right? Um, yeah, you've had that, right? Well, no, actually, our pay was an uh, archival book, and we put it in England, and we cover channels, so the whole world. Mm -hmm. We got royalty like the next year. Oh, so they, for some reason, they give us the English royalty, too. That's and nice. Make a lot of money out of it. But that is an exception of the world, because they will have say, like, well, your royalty is only for the print book and mm -hmm. the e-book. But... Um, 
But I know that you made a big difference in accounting. So they were probably doing a nice, it sounds like they were treating you well, and so that just would flag that, that that's an important thing to consider, especially right now. The market is so transitional. Please pay careful attention to your ebook royalties. Sometimes they're quite a lot less than the print royalty, and sometimes they're quite a lot more. There doesn't seem to be any yeah. rational reason for one or the other. Publishers are just experimenting, right? And so you can argue with them. So in the contract, does it differentiate between formats, or does it say we own, we own all formats? It totally depends on the contract. And just remember, these are being written by individual lawyers, right? Copied and pasted from other contracts, or just kind of to meet the needs of what that particular person thinks are good contracting principles and what they want to highlight or not highlight. Make sure that you, the you just read goal. through and kind of I'm flagging issues. So we'll, I'll give you some examples, okay, to kind of work through, but you just kind of flag some issues and try to understand the kinds of things that are in there. The timetable for manuscript delivery, manuscript acceptance and criteria. Here's one that people often forget about is they're like, okay, when the page proofs are in, I get 30 days or 60 days or two weeks, right, to return them. You know, you're just going to go right past that, no problem. Please look at your travel schedule, especially if you're the kind of person who does photography overseas or research in some archive in Italy or something like that, you know, and you've got a big trip planned and you're not going to have email access or at least maybe not time. Think about your scheduling, you know, because if you don't get the page proofs till after and then you have to fix something, then you can be on the hook for the extra charges to fix it after your date, right? So that's another thing to pay attention to. Um, what are their commitments for promoting it? Right? Hopefully, you have a good relationship with the editor who is um, going to work closely with the publisher with you and um, get themselves out to the right conferences, get copies out to the right reviewers, um, submissions to the right awards committees. Right? And again, this can sometimes be especially important for junior faculty or for faculty who are still on the promotion track. And um, if you're you know, trying to deal with that, this isn't necessarily something that you have to negotiate in the um, agreement, right? Because usually your interests are aligned in this case with the publisher, but it is definitely something to have a conversation with your editor about. And if there's contrary language in the contract, then you may, may want to modify it to permit those discussions with your editors. Um, the responsibility for included third-party materials. This is what I was talking about where you get to ask you know, if they say, you must get permission for everything, you must have signed permission for everything, and you're just like, no, I know for a fact that short quotes are an unproblematic case for fair use. I know for a fact that, you know, these screen captures that I'm doing where I'm kind of interrogating the details of, you know, the figure placement, that that's a really good case for fair use. Um, I, I think this contract should recognize, you know, fair use. And you, then you can change it to say something like, must get permission for um, third-party materials unless permissible under fair use. Right? So you can just insert simply that little phrase, and that can be hugely helpful. More on the timetable. Um, the, uh, you mentioned the 60 days to review something. Uh, almost every contract will specify what the author needs to do, and it says nothing about the timetable that the publisher needs to uh, work under. And so the uh, you know, I've had, there was one archival journal that was taking three to four years to publish oh. an article, and if you're on their tenure clock, that's uh, very that's unacceptable. So, yeah, um, it's a good idea to sit down <laughs> and say that um, you've got X number of months to accept a manuscript, and um, one year after that to actually have it appear in print. You know, the problem is that in reality. Um, if it hasn't appeared, trying to restart the clock someplace else probably isn't going to do you. But why, but, not, why not balance it between your time? Put in some commitments on the public. That's exactly right. Make it less one-sided. And um, one thing that I love to do going through these contracts is just insert, you know, reasonable Right, the word reasonable efforts or reasonable judgment, right, in, in the language. And that's on your obligations, but you can also insert that to basically add, you know, to their obligations, right, that they have to make reasonable efforts to ensure a timely publication, right? And then if they're not, that that is grounds for breaking of the contract. You'll often see that they have a lot of grounds for breaking the contract, right? And 
silent regarding you. You know, some publishers are better than others. Um, I would love to help publishers start to make their contracting practices nicer. I guess for German, you have to ask the editor, the editor, what is the background? Because, you know, I work for Latin America and the end journals, and they have pretty big background. <laughs> yeah. You had, a, and I know we're going to have one article in the pipeline for Rico and Caribbean studies, and it's coming, I submitted last year, and it's coming sometime this year. Yeah. So they couldn't tell me exactly. They, they tell me the number of the volume of the issue, but they can tell me is it going to be a spring, fall, or winter? It's coming. No. So, um, and I understood that when I came in because I know it's in the track. But I think that having that conversation even before you submit the article to a journal is important because, like I said, it's kind like, it's, it's of sensitive, then you really to know, well, look at the publishing volume and what year they are saying because the year two thousand nine and we're twenty seventeen so they have this backlog. Yep. And they still publish and they still follow in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. When they publish in twenty seventeen, it will be twenty ten. Yeah. Because it was just kind of it's funky. So some journals are funky like that, but it's like the smaller <coughs> Or they, you never know. I mean, they could just be having like editor turnaround or your editor. I mean, it can happen at a press too, right? And a book is a different story, but the book is like you really need to put the timelines in the contract. Yeah. Because you can have a book that takes six years to be published, and by the time you may have yourself for your tenure track. That's right. Were you raising your hand too? Or? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I recently signed a co uh, author book contract. and they, in the timetables and section, they specified that the publisher reserves the right to withdraw consideration on the manuscript at mm -hmm. any time. So what we did was make that clause reciprocal. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. for some reason life intervenes and we cannot complete the book, yeah. then we can withdraw it without any kind of personal repercussion. And as long as they're not giving you an advance, then that probably is that it completely good. If they are giving you an advance, then you want to think carefully, like if you're spending the advance on your new house, or you know, you want to make sure that you like escrow it, basically, right? Um, for if you think it's possible. Um, the publishing clauses, I love that Peter mentioned, you know, control over who has the right to sue, right? Um, you'll see this just super commonly, even in a contract that might otherwise be in many ways good, that the publisher assumes the right to sue on behalf of your manuscript without your permission or even or say so or anything. And um, this can be kind of awkward in the Georgia State University case, right? Like they were there were faculty who put up readings from their colleagues down the street in Emory or, you know, Georgia Tech, and yet, you know, then their colleagues' work was the subject of the litigation against them. So it can lead to some awkwardness. Um, so I would just say, you know, you can, again, just insert something short and simple, like, you know, with the author's, you know, permission or with the author's acknowledgement, that sort of thing, uh, author's approval. Um, revisions and future editions, my gosh. I, I really, um, oh, and actually, let me go back to defensive and offensive litigation. So the defensive litigation, right, they take the right to sue whenever they want, right? But what happens if somebody copies your work, plagiarizes it, and starts, the citations start going to the second, you know, the subsequent, the infringer, right? You actually then want your publisher to sue on your behalf. You don't want to have to engage an attorney, or at least maybe you want to have the right to engage in your attorney. And um, your publisher may just be like, you know what, it's not worth it to me to do this. They have the rights, but they choose to sit on them because you're the one bearing the costs of the loss of citations. And so again, you want to have the right to sue, at least have the right to sue on your own behalf, right? Um, so again, that kind of offensive litigation is also something that I think, you know, having control of the litigation can be more important than you realize. Revisions in future editions. Um, <laughs> publishers who accept a book, right, and especially if it's the kind of book where you might well do a second edition, right, will often say, hey, you know, we get the right to do second editions. By the way, if you're not available to do it, we can hire someone else to do it, right? You see, some of you have seen this, right? Very upsetting to people when they actually sit down and think about that clause. Like, oh my God, so they could just take it away from me because I chose to have a baby that year or something? You say, yes, yes, they could. So then you can, again, you can write over and then say with the author's approval or, you know, or not at all, right? So that's great. Remaindering copies, um, 
I'm gonna say I put this in because there's like this great poem that I love, which is like the book of my enemy has been remaindered. And I, I always think of that when I think of remaindering. But sometimes people like to get options to buy their remaindered copies. Publisher bankruptcy. It doesn't even show up in a lot of clauses. And for the really established presses, you probably don't care. But um, like South End Press out of Boston went um, bankrupt kind of recently, and it caused a big kerfuffle. We had a lot of you know radical faculty you know in the in the Pioneer Valley who had published with South End Press, and they were all of a sudden like, "Whoa, what's happening to our books?" Right? Well, South End did some things that were pretty good. They said you can have the electronic files and do what with them, or we'll transfer them to the public to the next publisher's list. But you want to think about that if you're publishing, especially with a smaller independent press. Um, I've also known fa- um, not faculty, but you know, writers, novelists who are published with a small press, and the small press changes hand from one person to another person, and now the other person is not interested and is sitting on their rights. You know, there's a very well-known and award-winning lesbian writer whose early work is out of print um, for exactly this reason, and it's it's a shame. So, publisher bankruptcy, publishers, just like these kinds of contingency clauses. Um, some tricky publishing clauses. Um, The attribution or moral rights. Peter mentioned that in the U.S. we don't have an attribution or a plagiarism right, but in much of the world you do, and you will sometimes see in these clauses a waiver of attribution rights. Don't ever do that. You have no reason on God's earth to ever sign a a waiver of your attribution or your moral rights. Just you just don't. Um, and and even if you're it's a contribution to an encyclopedia, you still want your initials, right? You still want your initials and then your name and the credit. And like if they do a subsequent edition, you don't want them to strip you out of it. Like yes, keep your moral rights. Um, the title and edits. Again, these are often things people think about. Translations. Such, I went through that story. That's such a big deal. The right to reprint your piece or just excerpts from your piece or to modify it. The competing works. Be careful with these. Okay. Um, most of the publishers, I think, I think there's a good faith reason for this. The publisher doesn't want you publishing book X here and a very similar but slightly titled differently book. Why over there? Okay, they don't, you know, and that is what I would consider a true competing work. Okay, but if the clause is written so broadly as to perhaps interfere with your right to publish excerpts in another work or a short version um, or a paper or deliver a paper, then you really want to edit that and be careful. Um, the right of first refusal. This can play either way. Some people are really happy to have a right of first refusal for the next book in their contract because they're like, hey, I've got an in already on the publisher for the next book, right? And other people are really unhappy because they're like, hey, the publisher has an in on my book and I already have a publisher lined up for this other book. So just pay attention to that. Um, The out-of-print reversion rights. This is my very, very favorite because it is so defunct and meaningless now, but it is so rich with possibility. Do you guys know what this is, the out-of-print reversion clauses? Well, I don't understand the principle, which is that guys go out of print, you ask them for them to become That's right. So you can do something else, and then I'll publish them. That's exactly right. Why does that, why is it, why do I say it's meaningless now? I don't know. Is that related with that issue about orphan work or something else? I don't know what, is, what does print mean. What does print mean, right? Because they've, they've got print on demand, yeah. digital copies. They just make it available for sale, and they can print out a copy. It never goes out of print anymore. So if they are just keeping in the same language that they had in the 70s and 80s, it is meaningless. It sounds really nice to you, like you have the copyright, but we have the rights. Um, but it's meaningless, right? But you can change this to be incredibly useful, right? Because it might be the case that you cannot negotiate them to accept a license to publish, okay? They want everything in all media, right? But basically, this reversion gets rid of the in perpetuity piece of it. Because what it does is it says, hey, if at some point, um, you know, they're under some condition, and it used to be out of print, so we're going to change that condition, then you have an option to get the word, the work back, okay? And so it gets rid of the in perpetuity piece, basically. Even if that language is still in there, there's this other clause, right, which can come in. And so you change that language. Instead of being out of print, 
change it to a particular volume of sales, right? If at some point, you know, the volume of sales falls below, you know, 20 copies per annum or something like that, then, um, you know, author has the right to terminate this and terminate the contract, so right? Like time, so like, I give you my rights. It can be term. Same day, same year, so it, it can be the yeah. It can be straight up time, or it can even be a combination. You know, if after five years the number of copies sold per year is below such and such, whatever seems like a sweet spot for you, you can do it. And so I love these clauses now. But you just want to make sure you write them that it's about copies being sold and not print copies being. Just strip the print language because it's um, otherwise it's really it's tricky. It's like another way of tricking authors, right? Um, and they might have little things, like especially you'll see in papers, right, in journal clauses all the time, you know, hey, we have the opportunity to give you this back, but they're not giving you enough back to make it really meaningful. So um, you want to get more back than they are. Uh, most egregious practices, is there anything I missed? Um, no. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually pass out some contracts and take a few minutes for you guys to look at these contracts. And um, I, you can have all of them afterwards because I think there's enough to share. But um, maybe just take like each one of you take one or two or one contract and spend a couple of minutes and go through and flag issues in this contract and how you might amend it. Peter, do you want to do this exercise? Sure. Really? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, and oh, one of them I gave is already um, kind of redacted, and so you can sort of see this person's redactions. Uh, sorry, it's redacted. It's already strict through, um, so you can see their strike throughs and edits, and you might like them or you might choose something different. Let's just take five or ten minutes on this, seven minutes. Does the camera pause or do you get to take me drinking? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think publishing clauses are really interesting. I actually just wrote a blog post about that. Oh, God. Yeah. Send, send me the URL because I love seeing, being able to refer people to things yeah, in their no, colleagues. I just, I just essentially talked about the necessity of paying attention to copyright yeah. right? because I remember signing my first book and that was like, well, yeah. Yeah, Me too. I, my very first book review, actually, in Government Information Quarterly, that. they got like all the rights. Right. Yes. And especially now, if you also talk about media convergences, I mean, I know. Um, think about when just publishing in print. It's, you know, I edited an online peer reviewed open access journal for a long time. And in Europe, most people keep their own copyrights. Yeah. Um, then what do you do if you want to do video format about content that you have in print format? And, yeah. You know, let's see, you want to do a small documentary. Actually, there's, like a, there's a science journal that is. Um, is it called Juno or something like that? That is, uh, it's about videos, right? It's like videotaping this procedure, right? Or this method of doing things. And they actually turn out to be kind of crappy about taking ownership of those works from publishers. So um, I actually need to get back into that and talk with our um, librarians about it because they had some people who were coming to them and saying, yeah, this contract is really crappy. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, now that we're getting new media to publish in, there's going to be well, new ways of being crappy. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm doing. I'm working on a project that is going to be a trade book um, with some video um, sort of trailers that I'm doing now, and I also want to have a web page on that. So you know, these mm -hmm. are kinds of yeah. three different types of media or hybrid projects. How do you copyright those things? That's exactly right. Oh, my pleasure. I, I was really serious. Like, I feel um, I care a lot about this. And I, can you remind me what time did we actually start? Um, we 
I think we started about five past ten. Five past ten, so mm -hmm. good. So I'll probably run us right to eleven or five past. So I'll, I'll feel okay to go at five. Okay. Yeah. I want I want to know what point we expected of me, so it wasn't so uh, how I can play a little How about like two more minutes on this and then you know, you can take them home and mark them up. I feel like that's your thing, John. You know what, I'll put the extras on the back thing, and then if people want to get copies of others just to see varieties, they can. Let's go ahead and break and just kind of walk through because I want to have time to walk through each one of the contracts at least a little bit. Um, and then there, you know, if you want other copies of them, they'll be there and you can have a copy of my slides and I'm going to give you a couple of resources because it is a lot to remember. Um, and honestly, this whole exercise is a trick to get you like practically physically doing it because it can be intimidating when you get the contract and also like too exciting. You're like, oh, thank God, I've got the contract now. I can go off my desk and you don't want to negotiate. But if you just get a little bit in the habit, it can, it can help you do it. Um, so um, who are my Roman and Littlefield people? Roman and Littlefield, like this corner over here. Um, so what kinds of things did you guys find in your contract? Anything on this first page? Yeah. Yeah? What kinds of stuff did you, let's start with clause one. Anything in clause one, say? Yep. <laughs> Yep. Yep. The exclusive right to publish and sell. Publish is. That sounds bad. So publish, publish is actually, um, typically we construe publish to mean to reproduce and to distribute. They also say sell. So publish isn't the legal term per se. It's actually just kind of the industry term. So you can see these contracts, right, and all contracts are written in English, right, which means that it's subject to just as many communication failures and problems. That's why we have litigation, right? So that means another point is you shouldn't be afraid to rewrite it in ways that are clear to you or more specific, right? So if you're just like, I don't know what publish exactly means, I'm going to say reproduce, distribute, you know, in print or something like that. I mean, you can rewrite it in ways that make sense. It's not magic words. Um, so... 
Yeah. It's me. Um, oh, I, whenever I see publish, I get nervous because under the 1909 Copyright Act, there was the right of publication. Mm -hmm. Talk about the right to publish, and that was changed to reproduction and distribution in the 1976 Copyright Act. But it suggests to me that this is boilerplate that was prepared before 1976. <laughs> well, the dirty secret, the dirty secret of lawyering, and you know, think about this if you're paying somebody 500 bucks an hour to write up a contract for you, is that they are mostly taking forms that they copied and pasted, and by they I mean we, that we copied and pasted from other places and, and you know, and then on down through the generations. Of course, otherwise you'd have to charge us 1500 uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to defend lawyer salaries because I'm pro bono. I work at a university and I get paid um, not the big bucks. Um, so the exclusive rights. So the exclusive rights, including. So I mean, basically, most of the effective rights that you would care about are being transferred away here. Did anybody think about ways of revising this, or that might be particular to you? You could revise it if you wanted to or not, right? You could save it like as it is and then, you know, try to trigger a reversion clause later on. That would be better. But the languages, that would be a thing to pay attention to again if you care about translation. And, and I care a lot more about translation now that I've had these incidents among my faculty. Um, the term of copyright have been defined before they say... <laughs> Grant us this for the term of copyright. Well, so the term of copyright is defined these days by your life. And why would a publisher not want to define it? Yeah, if they change it or increase it even, that's right, if they increase it longer, you know, now they get it for longer. Whereas if they said, you so know. So it's not the definition of, of copyright at the time that the contract is signed. It's whenever the contract is at least that's an arguable point, right? You could you could make that point if you were the publisher and you had more resources to litigate than the heirs of the author, right? Okay. Yeah, that's that's a slimy move. But you know what? It's all slime. It's all slimy on some level, right? Yeah. Because I mean, basically, they're yeah. writing it to their advantage. It's a business yeah. practice. They're writing yeah. it to their advantage. Um, okay, and then they say and during any renewals or extensions thereof. So they clarify they're just like just in case you're thinking we're slimy we're being up front we're taking it all right um and then um then what about anything else down here well you, you, any permission is necessary in order to return already published or the material code of the works shall be obtained and paid for by the author and you said before about yeah. doing something about except if they comply with the principle of fair use or yeah so. yeah because so, you're sort of obligating yourself to do all kinds of extra stuff if they that's decide. right so, yeah. any permissions now so as a lawyer i might say any permissions necessary i could read that to me like I, well these permissions are not necessary because they're fair use but maybe you don't want to have that argument with them later on so you can just write in in you know except as otherwise permitted by law right or something along those lines right good catch anything else well this is something else that was discussed about they specified meeting the deadline but you might want to include that they also have to publish mm -hmm. it in a reasonable amount of time or that you're from that's right that's a good point um, you know if you really wanted to take it in a more aggressive way if they don't publish it by a reasonable amount of time they could be liable to you for damages right imagine you know if you had a real world in which contracting these were kind of balanced contracts you know that would be the kind of clause that would come in it practically speaking and I don't mean to discourage you from aggressively asserting your own rights that probably wouldn't fly but you can certainly add in something to the effect of you have a t right to terminate um, if they are unreasonably withholding or unreasonably delaying right um, notice that it says it must be factually accurate original must acknowledge all intellectual debts right this it's a little bit of maybe a warrant or a promise mm -hmm. um, and I, I should say, like, I mean, I've read these contracts, but at the moment, I haven't read it, like, in the last few days, so I can't really, and I read so many, I can't really remember, so I'm kind of reading it through for the first time, and what I would typically do is I would scan it through for the first time and understand the pieces, and then I would go back and read it closely, and then I'd go back and look very particularly at the sections that I care about, and I would probably miss things, even still. Yeah. Yeah. 
Fourth paragraph, where now, if the author does not deliver the work to the publisher, uh -huh. where it says time to be deemed of the essence in parentheses, what is that about? Where are we at? Third, Where's... second and third line, fourth paragraph down. Yeah, that one, no wonder you pointed. Oh, time to be deemed, um, in form and substance satisfactory to the publisher in its sole judgment, time to be deemed of the essence. Um, I think that what is, that's saying is that the publisher can specify and, and be very particular about the time, right? In other words, when the publisher is saying this is the delivery date, then they're saying that the time is very important. And so it's putting just a little bit of extra oomph in that deadline piece for you. Now, in practice, almost all publishers expect their authors to be late, <laughs> okay? Well, and um, they give early deadlines or they'd be crazy. Right, and they, and they constantly renegotiate. But, you know, <laughs> that's a very common practice, but that doesn't mean that you won't fall afoul of something if you end up having a bad relationship with the editor or the editor's just having a bad day and they're just like, forget it. I'm tired of working with this person, right? So, again, that's why I like to have the contracts actually be as accurate and fair as possible and not count on sort of my friendly correspondences or my assumption of goodwill. So how would you modify that? Um, let's see. If the author does not, I mean, it would depend on what I was trying to get it, right? Um, the, I mean, obviously the publisher does not have to publish something that they find unsatisfactory, and you, that's not really a reasonable expectation of them. So I think I would modify it to be, um, I would tend to want to modify it to just be more balanced, you know, and, and then um, the author shall repay all months. And then just add some other sentences that said, if the publisher, you know, having received the manuscript in a timely manner does not publish in a timely manner, then the publisher, you know, must relinquish, you know, this contract is null, but the author gets to keep the advance or, you know, maybe, you know, like whatever those particular circumstances are. If it's an advance contract kind of book, you know, with advanced royalties, then, you know, maybe the author can keep them if the publisher is being unreasonably delaying, or if it was something along the lines of, you know, um, maybe there's some other concession you wanted, right, that the publisher didn't give you. Maybe that's a good time to put that in. Like, maybe you want them, maybe you were presenting a, a three-book series, right? Then the publisher agrees to go ahead and, you know, accommodate, you know, for the full series in the amount of time or something like that. So what is the process, regardless of all this conversation, but especially in this kind of cases, like these advances and all that stuff, is it worth it to a, to contact a lawyer to look at your contract just to make sure that the you know that you everybody's under your understanding and you're writing the right language. As a lawyer, I would never say it's a bad idea to contact a lawyer, but um, I think I think it's it. yeah, yeah. I mean, look, if you're signing a contract for a textbook and you're expecting or hoping to make a lot of money and the publisher is, if there's a lot of money at stake, then financially it's worth it, okay? Then, um, but if you're contacting a lawyer for an academic book that's gonna sell two to 500 copies and give you royalty checks, um, you know, to go to a few nice restaurants maybe a couple of times a year, okay? And so it's not a money issue. At that point, it's your academic issue. It's your academic credit and credibility. So you have to kind of decide you know, hey, um, how much are they going to fight back about my rights? You know, that sort of thing. I mean, I'm going to give you some more self-help things to read about your contract. And the fact is that the practice amongst writers and, and academics has been to negotiate, if at all, for themselves. And so it's not uncommon. I do think it has led to a real disparity in contracting practices and um, a lot of problems as a result of that. So... And I've had some people who, you know, really were just like, I don't know. And so I was just like, you should go talk to a lawyer and have them negotiate on your behalf, right? And sometimes that's worked out well for them. And sometimes, you know, it hasn't because sometimes lawyering up scares your publisher, right? They're like, well, why are you trying to strike this defamation from here? Why are you hiring a lawyer to do that? That makes me very nervous, right? So you have to think about this. It's, it's really part of any negotiation practice. You have to think about how carefully and how hard you want to negotiate, and bringing in a lawyer makes it hard, makes it a harder negotiation, I mean a more intense negotiation.
right? And what is like, so not so much that you want to bring a lawyer, but more like you want legal counsel. Yeah. For copyrights, for example. So like, so like, no more like you said, I'm sending my lawyer to negotiate with mm-hmm. the but more like, I have You want a, your lawyer to mark it up? And I want like the second set of eyes to look at what I'm getting and what I want to add. You know, I think. And there's any resources for, because I ask you, you know, not, not so much as a librarian, mm-hmm. but as a, I'm just thinking ahead because, well, after I said librarian, because I know that that's kind of question that we get from faculty. Mm-hmm. Is it worth but it to I, do it? What is my role? Like, I'm not a legal expert. Whatsoever. So I think it just ends up being yeah. really up to that level, that person. Like, is it their level of risk assessment? Is it their... Um, how do they feel about this manuscript? How do they feel about this contract? How anxious are they? I mean, it really is a very, very personal decision. Um, I will say it's, it pays to be really careful when you're going. If you just go to a regular copyright lawyer who's not familiar with publishing, they may not know the right things to look for. Most publishing lawyers are looking for uh, and negotiating on behalf of commercial writers, not academic writers. And so their scope and the things that they look for and the things they think are important may be a little bit different. A good lawyer should be able to move around those things. So if you have a working relationship with a lawyer, then it's great. But if you're just like pulling out of the yellow pages or the the State Bar Association, you know, then I would think a little more carefully. They might be good, but they may not quite know how to fit you. Um, Good at identifying areas of risk, but because they don't really understand the library context, yeah. they're not good at maximizing areas of benefit. And they may not, they may, I, I've had private counsel sometimes tell authors, well, you should just walk away from this. And the author is just like, I'm on the tenure track. And it's, you know, so they, they're literally, they're just not in a position to walk away. And then the lawyer's like, well, okay, you know, but like if they were, and I don't, I'm not tooting my own horn, but like if they were somebody who is like me, whose whole purpose is to, kind of educate you guys about like what your options are then you might be able to find a better option that said you know I don't take private um, private clients from sort of the same people that I serve you know in an educational capacity so but there are more and more institutions offering services like mine so that can be helpful Um, well I want to move through a few more of these but we can talk after too anybody else find some other things on this first page or the next page. Maybe just let's pick out some highlights, things that you thought were particularly interesting or notable. Here's the clause where the publisher takes the copy, um, will take out, preserve a copyright in the author's name, right? Sounds nice. And I don't mean to underplay this because it is nice to see your name with the copyright symbol in the book, and a lot of authors want that. Um, but again, you know, don't be misled by the window dressing into thinking that the substantive rights are there. Um, here's the indemnification pieces, right? The author covenants, warrants, and represents that the authors obtained agreements from all contributors to the work. And it has the power to make this agreement. So in this case, the author is probably an editor or maybe has some contributions, that the work is not violating any rights, that the author is not um, disposed of any of the rights granted to the publisher. Whoa. So that means that um, the author has not given any rights to somebody else. Maybe an open access um, thing at your university could trigger that. Um, or granted any rights adverse to or inconsistent with, nor are there any rights which would diminish, encumber, or impair the full enjoyment of the rights to the publisher, that no part of the work is libelous, obscene, or unlawful. Unlawful is very, very big, okay? Um, Or violates the right of privacy or any other right of a third party. So you're promising that there's nothing whatsoever uh, illegal in there. Okay, so that's interesting. So that seems pretty broad. On the other hand, it's that there is nothing that is illegal, not just that it's claimed to be illegal. So that's good so far. In no event shall the publisher be obligated to publish a work which may subject it to claims from a third party. Um, I might say which may, which in its reasonable opinion, again, I love adding the word reasonable, right, to these kinds of things, because you don't want them to say, oh, well, you know, your book has this picture of these, you know, far off distant people. I think it could public, you know, I think they could raise a privacy claim. That's not reasonable claim, perhaps. And so then you could add reasonable and have something to fight with them about. 
Um, the author will make changes. Um, the author agrees to hold harmless and to indemnify the publisher against any claim, demand, suit, action, proceeding, anything, expenses of any nature whatsoever arising from or based upon any breach or alleged breach of the covenant, that's another word meaning promises, warranties, and representations. So any claim, no matter how unreasonable, and now you're on the hook for paying the legal expenses until the whole thing gets resolved. Um, in addition, um, the publisher may withhold royalties. <laughs> um, and the publisher can retain its own counsel and have sold this Discretion. This is where you might say the author could similarly do so. There's often also like an aids and assists clause. Publisher and author agree to help each other defend should one of them decide to defend. So, so pay attention to that. The worst formation of this indemnification clause is when you see it saying, you know, against any claim, period, right? All that any claim, demand, etc., but not based on a breach of the warranties. Okay, that's the worst formulation. And you should always, in any kind of contract, publishing or otherwise, tie the, you know, what you're on the hook for to a breach of your promises. Because otherwise, the publisher could accidentally insert libelous material from another book into your book. Totally nothing to do with you, and you might still be on the hook. Right, so you want it tied to your violation of the war of warranties, and again, put in reasonable, you know, and and if you can change it to a finding that these things have happened and not just claims, that's better. So you, there's a lot of ways to tinker with this to improve it. You may or may not get it. These kinds of legal frameworks are the ones that are the things that establish a legal legal framework for when the contract goes bad. Okay, when the arrangement goes bad. And so they're not going to be coming into effect most of the time. But when they do, you want them to be right. So is there any such thing as a contract written without weasel words? You know, like reasonable and uh, all these things that really are not definite. Uh, we had a fight with the EPA a long time ago, and everything was weasel words, weasel words. It might, it may, oh, weasel. And um, it, is that what law is all about? Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. full employment contract for lawyers, right? Like we get to argue over what is reasonable. Um, here, here, let me let me flip it on its head. Okay, if you specify a, 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 an amount, a certain amount, you know, you, you believe it or not, you're not getting rid of the opportunity to fight over things. It's like, well, how do you measure that amount? You know, what what tests are you using to measure it? You know, when is it measured? So you're still going to be fights, but you've removed discretion. Right, and a reasonableness standard um, is there. What I think you should do instead of sort of necessarily saying, "Oh, you know, it's bad" or whatever, pay attention to what it really means. May puts in flexibility, right? Um, sh must removes flexibility. Sometimes you want there to be flexibility, and sometimes you don't. So use the word appropriately. Um, but the way your your lawyer. Sees reasonable and you sees reasonable will be maybe different from the way the publishers and then whoever's making the decision they may have another. It might be it might be different. Sometimes there are things which everybody agrees are unreasonable. Um, you know, if the publisher drops the manuscript behind the desk and literally loses it for you know a couple of years, pretty much everybody would be like, no, that's crazy. Um, so so then you have a little bit of armament in there by adding in something. You know, if the publisher unreasonably delays, right? Okay. Um, you can't just say if the publisher delays by six months, like. What does that even mean, right? I mean, the publisher won't agree with that because, you know, well, what if the typhoon knocks out my British, you know? I mean, so reasonableness is actually a friend in most instances. But well, they also use the word promptly when it came to the author getting back. To if you feel uncomfortable about a weasel word, define it, right? Yeah. But don't be, afraid, don't be afraid to use them because of your own prejudice against them. <laughs> I guess that's what I would say. It's like they're using them, you should too. So we are running, now it's 1010. And so I guess um, I, we're not going to have a, more time to kind of go through all of these, but um, I guess what I would say is you can pick up other copies of them. Practice going through and amending. You're welcome to send me um, your things and ask me questions about them. I, I do this. This is one of the things that I do. And so I'm happy to talk to you about it. You know, and again, this is educational. So it makes me happy. I feel like, oh, there are newly empowered people out there. Um, 
there are um, quite a lot of issues that you can look through. You can have access to the slides. The slides are my outline for talking, so it's not necessarily a guide. But there are a couple of guides that can be useful. Um, the Authors Guild, with whom I disagree, as Hamilton and Jefferson did, you know, on like almost everything, right? Nevertheless, did a good thing with their guide to contracts, which they put out in the last maybe year ago. So it's geared more to commercial authors, but it has a lot of this kind of overview of, you know, kind of general contract stuff. So you could Google that. The Authors Alliance is an organization that was established really because to meet a need in the market for authors groups that represented academic authors, right? Because their voices, our voices, were not being heard in policy debates. And so um, their website is a good website just to look at for resources. And if you decide to get politicized about these issues, then you can, you can join the Authors Alliance. Um, I guess um, that's it for me. Thank you so much. You guys have been very um, good, and I like hearing your stories as well. So, And if you have publishing contracts, I always like to get copies of them, especially the before and after. If you successfully negotiated, I love to get the before and after because then I can show people, look, this is how terrible it was before, and this is how it is slightly less terrible now. Is and I redact them. Is yes? it possible to get uh, yours or someone else's versions of before and after to use as demonstrations? I do. I have, a, I have quite a few sets of those. And so send me a, a, a thing offline, and I will do it. And I want to have more sets of them because you, it's just very helpful. Yeah. So um, my files are in total disarray right now, so you might have to send me a note and then remind me. But um, yeah. So thank you guys very much.